th th this concept um, it, it, it's kind of obvious. I hope you guys made the, uh, made the jump with me. Um, John Scully, uh, I met him, uh, two, was it two years ago or about, uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show. He, he delivered a fantastic keynote, standing room only, um, still being talked about. And I was really lucky because uh, about a year later, I saw a wonderful article in Business Week, and I immediately thought, he's an angel. <laughs> like, um, he, he's, he's really, you know, guiding these, these CEOs and partnering and, and uh, I just learned some, some other fantastic information which I'm sure he'll, he'll share, but the, the concept about this is kind of a from the trenches, uh, a from the trenches, what is it like day to day? These CEOs are, are all creating incredibly diverse and different types of products within digital health. And so I, I'm just thrilled that they agreed to come, and we're blessed to have them here. So thank you. I'll let John take it from there. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, really thrilled to be here with uh, three of the uh, very talented CEOs that I'm working with in healthcare. But I'd like to give you kind of a backstory as to uh, why I got into healthcare and why I'm excited about the companies that each of these CEOs is building. I was recruited by Steve Jobs 30 years ago as the first big brand consumer marketer to come to Silicon Valley. And at that time, that was a really controversial idea because everybody in Silicon Valley was an engineer. And so the idea that anybody would want a big brand consumer marketer to talk about anything with technology just didn't make much sense. Nobody did advertising in those days for technology products. Steve's vision, which as we all know turned out to be right, was that personal computers would be what he called bicycles for the mind, for knowledge workers, that uh, everybody was going to want to use uh, products that were going to enable them to be more productive. Well, it's 30 years later. And during that period of time, healthcare missed the personal computer revolution. It missed the internet. We're now into cloud and mobility. It sure as heck can't afford to miss that. And I think we're at a moment in healthcare where big brand consumer marketing, consumer technology can come together and maybe we can't uh, change everything in healthcare. It's a huge industry, 18% of the GDP, uh, will be $4 trillion in the US alone by 2020 but we can sure make a difference. And each of the CEOs who are with me today are motivated on making a difference in the consumer era of healthcare. Uh, Sonny Vu, uh, who is a serial entrepreneur and a very successful uh, engineer, mathematician, computer scientist, uh, is building a company called Misfit Wearables. Misfit Wearables is focused on the new exciting industry of uh, tracking, monitoring uh, people with uh, wireless sensors. <coughs> Next to uh, Sonny uh, is Randy Parker. Randy is also a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he is running a company called uh, uh, MD Live. MD Live is uh, one of three telehealth companies. Uh, telehealth is a very young industry, but I believe that it's going to be one of the largest uh, industries that we'll see created over the next uh, decade. Uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, last summer we ran a market research study and we wanted to see uh, what the uh, impact would be of uh, consumers when they actually had a choice uh, being able to buy a tele, uh, buy a, a uh, a healthcare service. And there are uh, 9,000 walk-in urgent care clinics in the United States. Now, they didn't exist 10 years ago. And the reason they have developed over this last decade is because emergency departments are incredibly inefficient, extremely costly for hospitals to run, and not a very pleasant experience for consumers. So we were astounded uh, to see in this fairly large sample of research that we did that 24% penetration, uh, meaning 24% of the population, had been to a walk-in urgent care clinic in the last year at least twice. 
And to put 24% into context, uh, that's about what the penetration is for the Apple iPad. Now, someone could say, well, gee, I didn't know that. I don't see any national brand of uh, uh, walk-in urgent care cleaners. Well, they're more like uh, um, dry cleaners. I bet there are a lot of dry cleaners across the United States, but there isn't any national brand of dry cleaners. Um, I think that's going to change, because I remember when there wasn't a McDonald's, when there wasn't uh, a Walmart, when there wasn't um, Starbucks, and yet we take these big branded services for granted today. Uh, I believe that over the next decade, we're going to see a number of big branded consumer healthcare services. Uh, telehealth will be one of them. I hope MD Live is at the um, top of the list. We'll see a big brand walk-in urgent care clinics. I'm not involved with that, but I'm a big believer it's, it's a, a part of our future. And the thing that is making this all happen now and why it hasn't happened three or four years ago and why we don't have to wait for another three to four years for this to happen uh, is what's going on in our healthcare insurance industry. If you look back to the end of the Second World War, we have had a healthcare insurance system which has been employer-based. We created a system after the war uh, which essentially said, here is a benefit that is tax-free that will go to workers and their families. And we now have about 95 million uh, people, workers, who are covered by this healthcare system. Um, and that is a system that has worked pretty well. It, until recently, um, we said, well, gee, there are a lot of people who still aren't covered, so the government decided to pass the Affordable Care Act. And the Affordable Care Act, which hasn't even started yet, doesn't kick in to, to be deployed until 2014, uh, that's going to bring in a parallel uh, universe of an entitlement system with mandates. Uh, it'll add up to 30 million uh, additional covered lives. And the consequence of these two health care insurance systems, one that's been around for decades, the other which is brand new, uh, are the derivative effects. And one of the derivative effects is already happening even before the Affordable Care Act is fully deployed. And that is that the health care insurance industry, the payers, are finding that their plans, their at-risk plans, uh, are changing, particularly with large employers who are moving to uh, self-insured employer models. And the employers can do things that the politicians can't. The politicians don't want to touch the third rail. The third rail is uh, we can't penalize people who are obese. We can't penalize people who uh, abuse alcohol or who smoke. But the employers can say, gee, we want a healthy population. And we'll take on the risk of insuring that population. It'll cost us less money because as the uh, mandates come up from the Affordable Care Act, it isn't accelerating the inflation of health care expense. And so the self-insured employers say, we can create incentives for people to live healthier. So if our employees will cut back on their weight, cut back on their alcohol consumption, stop smoking, exercise, we can create incentives. We can re even reduce their premiums. At the same time, the self-insured employers are saying, we will move towards higher deductible plans. Now, we've all become comfortable as Americans having an environment where everything is kind of a copay. But get used to an entirely new experience. And the new experience is going to be that probably the first $5,000 every year is going to be paid by us. Yeah, and that means suddenly that consumers, who are employees, are also consumers, are going to have to think about uh, what things cost and where they could get their services in an alternative way. Well, walk-in urgent care centers is one example of that. Another example of it is telehealth. Uh, in order to be able to see our healthcare system move from the procedure-based reimbursement that we have today towards outcomes, and, and all of us are familiar with, with the sort of aspirations that someday we'll have an outcome system, you gotta be able to measure it. Well, to be able to measure it, you gotta have metrics, you gotta have big data, analytics. Uh, another big change from when I came into the high-tech industry, uh, I was in 30 years ago at the beginning of the microprocessor. The microprocessor is a uh, technology that enables people to do things. We can do spreadsheets, word processors, uh, 
search the web, buy a product or service on the internet. But humans always involved. We're just now at the beginning of a new era, which is all about sensors. Sensors are mobile wireless devices that are essentially passive, but they can capture incredible amounts of information. And we suddenly have, with cloud computing, the compute power to be able to do massive processing of that information. And we'll talk about that a little bit with this, this uh, team here. Sean Heinegger, who is the uh, CEO and founder of SleepMed, and SleepMed is, is the merger of uh, Watermark Medical, which is a platform as a service company that uh, focuses on the entire end-to-end -end system of sleep management, going from uh, profiling to diagnosing people for obstructive sleep apnea to then being able to point those people who you know, are uh, uh, with sleep apnea uh, to a therapy, and then importantly, putting them on compliance and being able to monitor them over time. Unless someone adheres to um, the therapy course, uh, that's obviously going to be a problem for them. And the history is that many people who have sleep apnea will go on to a CPAP or an APAP, they'll stay on it for a few months, and then they'll drop off. And so uh, they're putting themselves at severe risk. From an employer standpoint, in self-insured employers, uh, this is not only the opportunity to deal with a health issue, but it's a huge productivity issue, and we'll talk to Sean about that. So uh, kind of connecting the dots between each of these entrepreneurs uh, who are CEOs of very exciting uh, new companies that are going to be, I think, uh, part of the foundation, first generation of consumer era of healthcare. Um, there is some commonality between them, and, and I think that'll come out in the conversation. So I'd like to begin with Sonny Vu, and Sonny, uh, tell us a little bit about what Misfit Wearables is up to. Um, you haven't actually released your first product yet, and I know you're pretty much uh, you know, in stealth mode in terms of what you've said about it, but uh, there probably are a few things you can talk about, and, and why you think this is going to be important uh, in terms of the consumer era of health. Well, um, you know, we talk about big data, and uh, you know, data's got to come from somewhere, right? We, we're either entering the data in ourselves, or they're being ambiently brought in in some way. And ideally, they are brought in. Ideally, the latter. And so, um, uh, so that's kind of one angle to it: is the, just the data feed, making that really uh, accessible and easy. Um, but we came into the wearable space through a, kind of a different path, and that was in my last company we did a blood glucose meter, did a number of blood glucose meters. Uh, one in particular was the last one that we did was a one that plugs into the iPhone, and uh, and that went that did well, and that was mainly because it en it enabled people to have one fewer device in their lives, namely, you know, you could just test your glucose on your iPhone now, which was great, and so we wanted to figure look into what else can eliminate technology from your lives, you know? Um, because you just want to move on with your life. You're not wanting to just fiddle. You, you, you want technology to serve you, not the other way around. And so when we looked into the wearables, so we, wearables was kind of a natural space, so we've been thinking about this for some years now, but one of the recurring thoughts that we found was uh, the space is a misnomer. Um, wearables are not, um, uh, are not very wearable. And so, uh, so we focused, so you know, we, looked, we thought about a number of, um, of approaches and just you know what is it that makes these things wearable and these devices to be you know use, useful because we talk a lot about sensors but at the end of the day you can have a really accurate sensor but uh, if you don't wear it the accuracy is zero and so uh, so we focused we've decided to focus on two things at uh, one thing at Misfit and that is to make great wearable products a great wearable product is something that you'd wear all the time a lot of people would wear all the time for a long time. And so we've thought deeply about this problem of wearability, and you know, and we've come to focus on two really key things, and that is wearability. Why people wear things? They wear it because it's beautiful. There's an aspirational aspect. It's comfortable. It serves some function and whatnot. But the other is um, that it's just uh, because it's really beautiful. You know, it's 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 appealing to wear. You just want to wear it. And so, uh, so wearability in that in that sense um, ends up breaking down to being either beautiful or invisible. And so we've uh, tried to make products in those areas. Shine, our very first product, 
you know, just tap it and this halo of lights turns on to tell you how well you're doing. It's the simplest possible product that uh, we, we could think of to make. Um, but the other part of it uh, that we focus on is just making it last for a long time. So uh, we're just, you know, John knows this, uh, we're obsessively focused on making these things last for a long time, not having to recharge. So none of our products uh, currently, um, hopefully in the future, uh, will ever require charging. Um, they just, for this, just last four to six months. You just switch the batteries uh, two or three times a year, and that's it. Um, and hopefully we'll be, uh, they'll last a lot longer in the future. But uh, the idea is to make these products um, desirable to be worn and you could just leave it on and forget about it. And so that's our, uh, our dream is to make a um, whole, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to work in this uh, whole, what I think is gonna be a new era in, in computing, and that is the wearable space. You know, we had uh, John and other, and his contemporaries uh, pioneered the uh, personal computer revolution in the 80s, and we had network computing in the 90s tablets and the mobile revolution, and now we're in, supposedly we're in the post-PC era of tablets and cloud computing. And I think one of the next great eras that, that is upon us is wearable computing, uh, whether it's smart watches or uh, sensor-embedded jewelry or sensor-embedded soft goods and textiles. Um, who knows? But it'll be, uh, I think we're going to be moving from these clunky, you know, plastic and rubber products, which, you know, are great trailblazing products for now, but into more integrated um, products integrated into the fabric, literally in some cases of our lives. Well, Sonny, um, there are a lot of cool products out there now. Uh, from what we hear, uh, many of them are selling really well. Mm -hmm. uh, we know there are accelerometers in smartphones, like iPhone, Android phones. Uh, all the data, data that's being generated potentially from these uh, d different products, whether it's yours or others, uh, What's the, the best opportunity to use this data in some useful way regarding people's wellness, people's fitness, people's health care? Well, one of the great challenges in this space and also others in, in the remote monitoring space, as if people have always talked about, is what to do with all this data and how to use it. And I think one of the, we were just talking about this earlier, you know, but I think one of the great industries that, are, that, is going, that has been created and will, will be, continue to be created more so is in, um, in the co personal coaching and the clinical decision support space, basically decision support. And I think that, that, that there will be, you know, with all of this data coming in, there will be companies, groups and groups of companies that will be making sense of this data for people um, and, whether, and it basically decision support. So one of, one of the interesting areas, I think, in big data analytics is what's called predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. And if you think back to, um, a very successful company like Google, uh, when the web uh, started to become uh, ubiquitous, Google brought order to chaos by introducing relevancy ranking. And that was a major step, and it created a $40 billion revenue stream for them with their, their advertising. Well, now we are in a different era where the computer power is far more powerful than it was 15 years ago, and where the ability to capture data, whether it's coming from sensors, such as the wearable products, or whether it's coming from social media or from almost any source, uh, gives us unstructured data and the, the ability to use probability math, statistics like Bayesian statistics and Markov chains and Monte Carlo game theory, use these type of, of predictive analytics, which in my era at, at school, you know, we could only dream about. We had no compute power to do what we can do today. What do you see as the opportunities to be able to use predictive analytics and massive amounts of data that can be captured from wearable products and how it might play into um, healthcare? Well, um, as the name, uh, uh, as seen in the name predictive analytics, you know, just the, that alone is, is an, just an incredible idea. The fact that we will be able to predict things that, that computers and devices will know, know things before they will happen. I mean, that, that's, a, that's incredible. Like, that, that seems almost science fiction, you know? And, uh, and, 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 you know, from a very consumer sense, it's almost like predictive analytics wearables. I think these are giving what are gonna give us, in a sense, superpowers, you know? Things that uh, humans were not capable of before. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, fi finally, 
um, the era of personalized medicine and um, and just uh, uh, um, you know when we talk about prevention, it's going to have a whole new meaning now that we have uh, predictive uh, abilities. And uh, so I, I think it's, it's, it's an incredible trend. Yeah. That, uh, well, Sean, you remember last year you and I went to Caltech. Yes. And uh, we saw uh, some really interesting sensors. You, know, you might just describe what that was. That was pretty cool. Yeah, so um, they're working on some technology that uh, enables us to look at uh, proteins and, and have the ability to determine, uh, even before the patient asymptomatic uh, knows that there's something going on, can be addressed real time, feed that data back to a machine or to a, a care provider, and an intervention can be made or, you know, call to action. Um, to Sonny's comment earlier about, uh, you know, this idea of predictive, you know, one of the challenges we have in healthcare is getting uh, the patients just to do what the doctor asks. You know, this whole notion of, um, engagement and compliance has, has been a challenge that we've been dealing with, you know, for the 25 years I've been in healthcare. Uh, I think the fact that um, people will know, uh, will have feedback, real feedback, uh, before a catastrophic event can occur and, and we can make modifications is, is really exciting. So just to give you a perspective on how powerful um, computers are today, uh, the human being has typically two million proteins. And what we saw was uh, the ability to take a slight, just a scratch below the skin surface so you can oxygenate the, the skin, and this gives the ability to capture all of those proteins with a sensor. Um, the ability with um, quantified self to be able to monitor millions of proteins down to the individual and then if you think of things like gene sequencing, which 15 years ago, Craig Venner spent over $2 billion proving that you could sequence a human gene. Uh, I guess uh, two years ago at uh, CEF Health Summit, uh, we saw the first $1,000 gene sequencer. That'll probably be down to $100 pretty soon. So the ability to uh, take DNA gene sequencing, take protein uh, analytics, uh, add to that uh, being able to track externally, you know, all kinds of uh, different um, attributes from a human. The massive amounts of data that this will generate, uh, you couldn't even dream of this in science fiction five years ago. And yet it is completely practical today. I mean, it's just a, the, the change that we've gone through in high technology in the last five years does not follow Moore's law. Moore's law has always been a predictable uh, algorithm that says roughly every 18 months we double, double the performance of a microprocessor. Well, this is going up exponentially. Uh, and the costs are coming down at the same time. Uh, so the implications for medicine, I'm not a doctor, so I can't really talk about that, but others could, but the implications for medicine are amazing because you can really start to think about medicine as a system. Um, so it can be a system which can be individualized uh, and a system that can also be generalized from, the, from population um, you know, management. And it can give doctors um, information that they couldn't even have contemplated a generation ago. So Randy, as a lead in to you on MD Live, you know, how do you see telehealth being able to take advantage of that? Yeah, so we uh, really focus a lot on, one, the accessibility uh, and the lack of accessibility that's going to occur with the shortage of physicians, certainly in an accountable care uh, organization uh, that we're, we're moving towards. And what we do at MD Live and what we have done is develop tools to actually make it simple and easy for consumers to connect with their providers over uh, multiple modalities, and it could be a mobile device, a desktop, or a smartphone. We also, in that basis, have decision support tools based on evidence-based medicine that can allow the consumer to determine whether telehealth is appropriate or not. And so they go through, uh, based on their diagnosis, 
we can let them know at that particular point if telehealth is appropriate, and if it is, we can connect them to a provider based on the geo-target of where they're at and all the, the providers. We have over 2,000 current providers on our system, both uh, therapy and uh, medicine. We also connect to over 150 hospitals, so we can more efficiently, through the platform, connect them uh, in that basis. We can also make an assessment for them whether telehealth is appropriate. The last thing we want to do is have them through this uh, service, these services to connect with providers virtually if that's not appropriate. And we have tools to uh, acknowledge that and refer them either to a, a, a brick and mortar f uh, facility where we can provide appointment times and allow them to do that. The other thing that we do is, is that we have what's the digital clipboard, so the medical history that they take through our applications gets passed on and we connect to over 40 different EMRs through that process. Now, Randy, uh, in the early days of the personal computer, um, when people were looking at um, MS-DOS, you know, command and control screens, and, and uh, you had to be pretty technical to use the internet before the World Wide Web came along. Uh, it was basically used by um, engineers and computer scientists. Uh, in healthcare, talk a little bit about what you're doing from a consumer experience, because uh, First, you've got to get people to trust the service right. and believe it's reliable and as good as or better than what they're doing now. But then the experience has to be good enough that people will come back to it time and time again. You know, so uh, when I think about healthcare, I don't think of anybody offering a great consumer experience. I mean, there's no comparable I can think of in healthcare that we want to say, I want to be like that. Uh, right. How do you think about uh, the consumer experience. Right, so we, we everything that we do is focusing on providing an experience to our customers that has never been offered before. It's certainly healthcare as, as a, a, provides just awful experience in general, never had to worry about experience before. So it, w one of the things that we have to do when our physician panels, we have a, what we call MD Live University. Our physicians actually train providers across the country how to be able to provide a virtual house call, something that they don't learn in medical school. And of all the physicians that go through this uh, process, probably more than half of them, which could be uh, fantastic physicians, don't make the standard of being able to provide that extra effort uh, in a virtual uh, visit capability. So this every touch point that we have throughout our process is uh, of that standard. And what kind of customer satisfaction measurements are you getting? We measure each, uh, we do a survey on each uh, encounter that takes place that we've done and uh, we're, I think uh, currently we're running around 96% of our customers are extremely satisfied with the service that we're providing. Yeah. So, so as I recall, you do a call back with every patient that has a session with a Everyone doctor? Everyone gets an outbound call by one of our health service specialists of every encounter, yes. Now, one of the things Randy did was uh, he said, we can't afford to outsource our call centers to India or somewhere else. Uh, so we said, we'll pay the higher cost. Now we can't afford, we can't afford it because of the experience that we would be providing. Yeah, but the point is, we were willing to pay whatever it costs mm -hmm. to have our own people so that we could train them up to a, a level where we could credential them uh, with the idea that um, we should have a no compromise consumer experience. It's the Apple experience, not the Best Buy experience right. that we strive towards, exactly. So, uh, Sean, you, you and Randy uh, actually share a common relationship with Cigna. We do. Uh, and uh, Cigna is, like all of the insurance payers, is having to reinvent itself. Um, if you are a health insurance payer and you've been getting 90% uh, of your revenue from selling at-risk plans to employers and all of a sudden the pendulum shifts and employers are moving to self-insurance models. Uh, that changes the role of the payer to a BPO, a business process outsourcer, which is not as good a business model as if you are an at-risk plan company. Uh, so Cigna and Aetna and United Healthcare, um, you know, all of the big players, Humana, the Blues, they're all having to rethink, you know, what is their model going to be to engage a relationship with the patient and again, this plays into to the consumer era of healthcare. Sean, talk a little bit about how you see that affecting 
uh, sleep and how sleep is delivered today yep. and what you see it being perhaps in a few years from now? So um, first of all, we came up with a piece of technology that made it really easy to um, engage the 130,000 primary care doctors out there that see patients roughly 950,000 plus office visits a year to uh, screen and test people for obstructive sleep apnea. It's about 24% of the U.S. population has this disorder. Um, and the reason it's resonating um, quite a bit now on the employer side, first on the consumer, when consumers realize that eating healthy and exercising was a waste of time if they didn't get proper quality sleep, it really, you know, struck a nerve. Um, on the employer side, we see a 50% reduction on medical spend when we identify a patient who has OSA and we get them on therapy. Um, and because of our, our platform, we're able to identify these individuals, get them tested at home, and it's a tenth of the cost to diagnose. So uh, much better user experience, patients in their own comfort of their own bed, they're not worried about some people you know, watching them while they sleep, um, and it's also a lot more affordable. The, you know, the tie-in uh, with Cigna, clearly Cigna's trying to bring added value to their, to their customers, their clients, and those large employers are looking for ways to address absenteeism and, and, and lost productivity. Um, sleep's been in the top five employee complaints for the last few years. Um, and they're, they're very focused on trying to bring uh, additional services uh, you know, to these customers. Yeah. And, and because of the high comorbidity between sleep apnea, obesity, type 2 diabetes, other chronic care diseases, uh, if you can correct OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, with an employee or with a member of an employee's family, uh, that has huge ramifications in terms of cost for employer. Uh, absolutely, and, and the, uh, the tie-in that Randy and I, I have is a lot of the employers said, you know, we love the idea of you doing these uh, engagement uh, programs, but we don't want to have to have our employee run off and go see a doctor. So with Randy's technology, uh, we identify who's at risk. There's a physician consult done telephonically uh, where the prescription's then ordered for the diagnostic test and we mail a, a device directly to the patient's home and in, in less than a week, that patient, if they're at risk, is on, they're on yeah. therapy. And then talk about the therapy side, because you have a complete end-to-end -end, uh, system. So once the patient is diagnosed, we have a technician show up at their house and service them on the appropriate therapy based on the prescription and their needs, and then we stream the compliance data uh, from the device, and there's sensors built into these in, into these devices that actually tell us if, how often the device is being worn, if there's any leakage uh, on airflow. Uh, those are all things that, if you address early on, you get a much much better um, compliance rate. Yeah. So, zooming out and just looking at it from the payer standpoint, if a payer ends up being a BPO to the self-insured employer. That's not a particularly interesting future. On the other hand, if the payer can be the bundler of a group of uh, services that can be everything from you know, therapy for sleep apnea to uh, co coaching services for you know, uh, everything from depression to um, you know, issues that are important to uh, families, uh, that all of a sudden changes the model to be a much more value-added relationship for the payer with the self-insured employer. And in your case, Randy, you've been signing up uh, um, self-insured employers at a rapid rate. Uh, about every 10 days, it looks like you have another major name you know, added to, to, the, to the list. Um, how do you see your role working with a large payer uh, as you go out into the future? All right, so just the, the size of the market is there's 100 million employees that work for corporations uh, as of January of this year that are self-insured. Uh, so that's the, the market opportunity in that case. And when we become 
partnered in that, integrated into that solution with the payer who's providing these services. We offer uh, a triage so that the employee is being uh, appropriately sent to the most affordable quality uh, location and streaming them so they don't inappropriately go to the uh, emergency department. About 70% of the cases that go to the emergency department uh, did not have to be there. So in our service, uh, through connecting directly with a doctor and taking an assessment, we can uh, stream them to lowest cost of care and save the self-insured employer and in turn having the health plan add a lot of value uh, in this relationship that they've now had to transform themselves yeah. to. And, and there's also uh, some disruptive uh, pricing opportunities because uh, a doctor being able to have a virtual visit consultation with a patient is less expensive for the patient, therefore less expensive for the self-insured employer, less, is that correct? It's, yes, it's, it averages around $38. It also allows the practices, so we have many of our physicians that have practices as well. They supplement their in-office appointments with virtual appointments, and in doing so, that gives them the ability to spend more time with the patients that need it, and also be able to uh, appropriately provide the right levels of services uh, from a virtual uh, perspective. So uh, while there are a lot of things going on in the employer market, uh, there are also a lot of things going on with hospitals. And hospitals are consolidating, uh, primary care physicians are selling their practices to uh, hospitals. Uh, specialists are joining up into hospitals. Uh, so there's a bundle of services that hospitals are doing with larger scale. Uh, ACOs are becoming, you know, another uh, important uh, aspect of how hospital care is, is delivered. And you have a hospital strategy. Uh, talk a little bit about what your hospital strategy we do. is. So the, the hospitals are in the best, the stronger hospitals are in the best position to actually take the risk and to provide the care. They're going out and acquiring the practices in the specialty uh, environments, and they want to, with inside their catchment area, they want to be able to uh, be in a position through the accountable care uh, ACOs where the, the models will change from to a capitation where the, they won't be rewarded on a fee-for-service basis, but they'll be rewarded on an outcome basis. And so in that case, where there is full risk that's being taken in that basis, they can use our, our technology to more efficiently be able to manage and work with products that Sonny's building and Sean's building as well through our physician networks. We have identified that in that case, we can be an important component to create an integrated delivery network to resolve the issues of fragmentation we capture medical histories and we can send clinical documents amongst disparate systems so that in all cases, the encounters that take place with the patient is documented and then sent to the primary care uh, physician's office or back to the ED from a continuity of care perspective. And the hospital systems across the country are positioning themselves to, uh, to be in a role to capture the um, you know, additional types of uh, growth that's going to happen inside the covered uh, populations that exist. So the model we have in uh, self-insured employers is it's our doctors, it's our nurses, we do the whole triage uh, process. Uh, it's a turnkey service. Uh, when we're working with hospitals, Randy is really out uh, uh, developing geographic relationships across the country. And in that case, we may well be working with the hospital's own doctor's population. Yeah. So we are powering the system, bringing together uh, the complete system Randy has, but in that case, we can default to the hospital's own doctors. What's important to the hospitals is they want to be able to employ their doctors, they want to be able to generate patients for their, to fill beds, uh, and they want to offload uh, low acuity care from their emergency departments, and all of those things are part of what we do. Also, more clicks and less bricks. They can't just keep yep. building massive building structures. They have to be able to use virtual access to expand yep. that capability. And, and, and Randy, just uh, say a few words about what MD Live is uh, going to be able to do about the uh, readmit problem uh, with chronic care patients who were 
uh, once they are discharged from the hospital, if they're readmitted within 30 days, the hospitals are on the line right. for that expense. And that 30 days is expected to soon to go to 60 days and then ultimately 90 days. So that's a right. very, very big uh, cost issue for the it hospital is. systems. And how does MD Live think it can play a role it in is. helping so solve that problem? Since we've created the, the technology to integrate from their practices or our doctors and the post-discharge when the patient leaves, we have our own nurses. We are able to view the case history from the medical uh, charts that took place when the patient left the hospital, and we can be very proactive using both mobile strategies and outbound calling strategies, but also, as Sean mentioned, the compliance, just making sure that the, what's supposed to happen as the post-discharge plan is happening, and if the patient does end up having to go back to the ED, then everything that took place during that period of time, we can transmit it so that they're just not walking in from cold scratch, and the outcomes are, will be phenomenal. And uh, an example of, of how we can adapt uh, the MD Live telehealth, uh, another example is uh, drug chains. And uh, what uh, we think will happen with telehealth and kiosks and, and uh, pharmacies and drugstores, you can just say a few words about that. Right, so that's where the people have to go when appropriate and get their prescription filled. So number one, we electronically send prescriptions for uh, the patients from the provider network when is required. The other is is to use those as places that, through kiosks, that we can get biometric data to be more relevant, also to have better access from the uh, leveraging of the pharmacist with inside those retail footprints. So uh, in, in that kind of an example, um, somebody says, gee, I've got, uh, you know, uh, I feel like I've got the flu or maybe it's sinusitis. Um, I, I wish I could get a prescription for it. Uh, I'm, I don't know how to get to a doctor. It's 8 o'clock at night. What do I do? They can go to the drugstore. There'll be a kiosk there. Uh, there is, normally, we'll say we'll get you a doctor within you know, 10 or 20 minutes, but here we have a special pool of doctors uh, that will say we'll get you online within 60 seconds. Right. And we can then let the doctor do their diagnosis if they determine that the patient should have a script. It's there right there. It's right there, and it can be filled by the pharmacy. Right. We also do that for labs as well. So we lab core request. We fully integrate it so the physicians virtually that need to get blood work can send electronic orders to any lab core or any quest in the country. And then we electronically get that to the portal in minutes instead of having to wait from the customer perspective. So it's, it's very, very efficient. It doesn't replace the need to go to a brick and mortar physician because that's absolutely but using this in that way will really make a big difference in transforming uh, just a better quality uh, care uh, infrastructure. John, I, I, to, to that point, um, I want to give the crowd a, a use case. I watched a documentary a, a few months ago called Forks Over Knives, and uh, it inspired me to uh, go have my blood work done at 8 o'clock in the morning the next day. The only way that was able to happen is I called MD Live, I had the prescription ordered for the blood test, <laughs> and at, I walked into Walmart, there was a lab core there, um, had the blood work done, and in less than three days, you know, I had my baseline uh, work up. So that's, you know, part of where this whole digital health and consumerization healthcare is going. It's gonna be around convenience yep. and ease of use. Well, you know, if you think back, um, 20 years ago, and, and this is before the World Wide Web, uh, but people were experimenting with uh, electronic banking. And it didn't really work very well because you know, they had to be proprietary systems. And then in 1994, the World Wide Web became possible. And then people s said, well, I don't know if I can trust the web to do a financial transaction. So it didn't really catch on then. And yet, can anyone imagine you know, not using uh, electronic banking today, uh, but there really isn't any paper uh, banking systems any, anymore. Uh, it took a period of time. It took 20 years for people to go through those different stages, the technology to go through those stages. I hope well, it doesn't take that long in my case. And that's the question, <laughs> Randy, be, 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 because the, uh, the technology is here. This is not a technology issue. There, there is no technology that anybody needs to create or wait to happen. Um, so the big question is, 
uh, how long is it going to take for the adoption curve to go up where people trust the experience of a virtual doctor visit for low acuity care versus the way they've been doing it up until now? Yeah, so I think it's, I mean, there's, there's been telemedicine for 25 years. This is not a new technology. I think the adoption of this types of, type of service that we provide at MD Live um, will accelerate, one, because technology, as you uh, have stated, just the acceptance, although we have to use secure video collaborations, we cannot use Skype. Skype and other, other formats like FaceTime and the use cases that people are very familiar and very comfortable, even at all ages. My mom is 74 years old and she's on Skype all the time. And so I think the transformation of our product and service with the experience and the way that we're doing it and aligning ourselves with health systems, not health insurance companies that have a, whole, a very high level of, of, of distrust. So people do not trust their health insurance plans. We were at a convention in uh, Vegas that we just came from, the American Health Insurance Plan, and even they were saying, we don't know if you should include us in that because the, our uh, members do not trust us, but they do trust their health systems. They, they do trust the systems that they're used to, whether it's you know the larger brands that exist like Mayo and Cleveland and Scripps in the US or Centera Health System. So we really are making an effort to uh, empower local healthcare around brands that they trust to get an adoption of that perspective and acceleration. The other part is, is the uh, reimbursement of this uh, across 19 states that has become uh, available uh, on that basis. And the last thing, we're all going to become uh, health uh, consumers. We're all gonna have to pay for healthcare to some degree. There's gonna be high deductible and out-of-pocket expense that we've never had to deal with before, so we will become much more aware and choices will be important uh, for us to choose and ac access and uh, choices and access. Some people will go to urgent care, other people will use services like MD Live, and I think we'll see a big acceleration of that use case. That, that point right there is why it's not gonna take 20 years, because now we're gonna have to pay for it. And uh, we know next year is gonna be a 40% rate increase to small business size. And that's gonna make these high deductible plans accelerate and consumers are gonna become very you know, price sensitive. Uh, I was in Canada earlier this week and I was watching a television show and they were saying that uh, the queue, people waiting to see doctors is now up to four months. Uh, absolutely, the wait and time is incredible. I don't think Americans realize that when you add 30 million more people into the right. system and uh, the primary care physicians are retiring because yeah. the, the medical insurance liability is so high and their costs are so high and their, uh, you know, the regulations are so expensive that they're either selling their practices out to the hospitals right. or they're getting out of the business. And so we, it's estimates are somewhere between 130, 140,000 uh, primary care physician gap. And so take your, today's wait time is 20 days to make a doctor appointment. Um, what is it gonna be three or four years from now? Well, hopefully, telehealth will be able to relieve some of that. It'll be a minute or less. And, uh, well, CMS has estimated that over 50% of face-to-face um, -face doctor visits could be done just as well in a, in a virtual visit. Um, but it really comes down to, uh, is there a system there that, that works? Is the experience you know, really uh, so exceptional that people feel comfortable you know, doing it? Um, I believe that the transition we made from when doctors made house calls to when people had to go to see their doctor, that was a huge transition for people. Um, then we're now gonna make the transition from people having their own doctor to people having a highly qualified doctor who may be a different doctor each time they visit that, that doctor. And the thing they have in common is that the electronic health records uh, are gonna get better and better. The challenge we have is with chronic care patients because they're 17% of the um, population, but they're 78% of the health spend, and they don't have one doctor, they have four or five doctors, and we still don't have full interoperability between all of the different healthcare systems. So that's gonna take a period of time. Sonny, as you think about this world of data analytics, because uh, you've been in healthcare for a long time, and, and uh, 
at uh, Agamatrix, you were dealing with uh, type 2 diabetes, which is really epidemic proportions now. Um, how do you see this challenge of getting interoperability between data of all the different health systems and, and the complexity of chronic care patients who have multiple doctors, and now all of the new ways in which data could be captured, particularly for things like compliance, uh, where sensors, wearable sensors, could actually uh, be a part of the solution of tracking are people staying in compliance, and can we actually have some success stories with disease management, because disease management doesn't have many success stories. How do you see that whole world of data shaping over the next, you know, five years or more? You know, I think our notions, uh, we, we talk about uh, data ownership a lot, this term comes up, and um, I think our notions of data ownership uh, will may change or at least morph in the coming years as data becomes more profuse and uh, the data exhaust, as uh, Tim O'Reilly says, uh, becomes just more, um, yeah, more diffuse. And, and so uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's still uh, going to be about um, uh, data ownership, but maybe, but ownership uh, denotes some sort of transactional nature. Like if I own something, I can give it to you or not. And um, I don't know, maybe our, our, our views of that might change in the coming years and it'll be about data access and, um, uh, and this term will not be put to rest, but we'll just talk about it less. Just like how we, we, we don't really, um, just it's, it's, it seems kind of crazy to, to pay for music now compared to just paying for access to music. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I don't have a much of a point there other than that I think these, these views will change in the coming years. Um, I, and I, I also wonder whether notions of privacy will change in the coming years also as different generations of people who have different uh, sensitivities to privacy will, might change. And so, uh, you know, that, that, that might happen as well. I mean, people are posting all sorts of things much more sensitive on their Facebook pages for, and tweeting about it for the world to know than, than just their health, health information <laughs> in, in some cases. Um, but in terms of interoperability, I, I feel like it's, uh, I don't know if it's going to be a self-organized type of uh, thing that's going to happen in the coming years or not. But, uh, you know, you have efforts that are, that are attacking this, you know, the Continuum Health Alliance, you know, we've never really uh, done much with them, but I'm sure they're doing good work. Um, and so, yeah, so I think this ecosystem will, in, in many, I think there will be some self-organization to this. I don't know if a, a third party, the government or whoever imposing standards, I don't know if that's a, a, a ever going to be all that successful. Um, you know, and it, it may just be one of the big companies, you know, uh, the, the consortiums of large companies getting together and, and making it happen. But these things take time. Um, I mean, even some, you know, uh, standards like HTTP, you know, it took, you know, it took, to took to or HTML, took time to, for people, for us all to agree on. So mm -hmm. I think it'll take time, but it'll, it'll obviously yeah. happen. Sean, I'd like to give you the final word on, 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 on a question. Um, and, and that is, even when we know where we think things should go in healthcare, um, like we know it should become you know, more outcomes-based and fee-for-service is going to continue to see you know, pressure on reimbursements uh, and comparative effectiveness is putting you know, pressure on reimbursements. When you take sleep apnea, which for years has been sleep labs and DMEs, durable medical equipment, uh, sales channels, how do you see getting these entrenched legacy uh, models to, to shift towards the kind of things you're doing at Sleep Med? Yeah, I, well, first of all, the challenge I think we all are faced in healthcare is uh, the incumbents. The people that are in this business today are making um, a lot of money. And what's going to enable uh, disruption and change is this whole notion that the consumer is becoming not just empowered with data, uh, but they're, they're going to be responsible for paying for it. And it becomes really relevant to you when it's coming out of your pocket. Uh, we've, you know, we've noticed uh, uh, already dramatic behavioral changes uh, with some of our employer, you know, clients. So I think it's, 
just the fact that that the uh, population is going to be paying for a big chunk of the you know the, of the medical spend is what's going to enable this to happen. So I'd like to thank our, our panel. I'd like to say that um, the takeaway I'd like to leave you with is that when you zoom out and look at an industry as massively complex as healthcare, and then you start to try to connect the dots, and now with technology, we can actually realistically talk about connecting dots in a very practical, cost-effective way. And then you try to zoom in and say, how do we simplify this complexity and come up with better ways of doing things? Um, I really think that there are possibilities for incredible success stories in entrepreneurial disruptive innovation, uh, not just from the panelists who are up here with me today, but uh, I believe that we're going to see what didn't happen over the last 30 years in the healthcare industry, where they missed the PC, they missed the internet. You know, I believe that there's gonna be a chance for uh, a lot of innovation. Uh, some of it will be technology-based, some of it will be systems and services-based. Uh, I think in almost every case, the most exciting things are gonna involve uh, consumers getting involved with their own health. So, Sonny, Randy, Sean, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It.